this is a really early build. I think this build was about 2010. We used to do a lot of things different back then. Talk about the AC a second. The air conditioning works excellent in this Jeep, but it's working off pressure switches, which means it's, we're pulling the signals out of the Jeep side, running it through pressure cycling switches that monitor for high pressure and low pressure, and they cycle for EVAP temperature and then they control the compressor and it works great but it's all mechanical it's more switches more hardware more wires today it's all done through the CAN bus so there is no additional hardware the main harness in this Jeep was hand built we literally strung them out by hand installed all the connectors built the fuse block the hardware in this Jeep is very similar to the hardware we're using today we were cutting out accessory drive brackets from steel and having them powder coated that involved cutting them out cleaning them up bending jigging, welding, powder coating, a lot of work, but when set up properly, they work great. When not set up properly, they squeak and you had issues, and that's why we went to the billet brackets. So essentially, these are the predecessors to the billet brackets. Same layout, same design, it's been working year after year. I think it's important to understand that back in 2010, 2009, there wasn't a whole lot of guys putting LSs and JKs, so everything was a learning experience. The Prindle itself was being run by a Prindle driver that we installed inside of the shifter. Today we're of course doing that through the CAN bus, but this is still working perfectly. If we look at the cruise control in this build, essentially what we have, let me turn the light on here so maybe you can see it, is a stock JK switch that we have installed the GM electronics into. That little LED, the green LED, actually acts just like the cruise indicator in a GM vehicle so you can use it for diagnostics. It was quite a trick to get the electronics inside of that switch but we did it for a couple of years and it works great. The cruise control on this Jeep still works great because essentially all we're doing is mimicking the GM switch. We're still running a body control module, engine control module, transmission control module. They're still networked properly with the proper calibrations. We have all the proper power and ground distribution paths even in our hand-built harnesses we didn't cheap out and eliminate power or ground distribution. We, we supported it fully. I mentioned a little bit about the air conditioning. Both the Jeep side and the GM side can control the air conditioning. In this earlier build, we essentially only used the air conditioning on request. And we took that and we put it through our module. And our module controls the air conditioning for a lot of different things. One for evaporate temperature or outlet temperature. We want to keep that outlet temperature about 40 degrees. So our module will cycle it. And we were doing that five years ago. This particular build still is running the switches and the switches were not as accurate as our electronic integration, but it still kept the temperature within uh, 40 to 45 degrees. The new electronics essentially take the can signals and it's bi-directional. We can pull the EVAP temperature right out of the Chrysler side, put that into the GM side so that it reacts to it. Less hardware, less wires. Does it work better? Eh. This Jeep does maintain smart charging with the Chrysler alternator, which basically means that the TIPM sets the charge goal and the PCM follows it with the field control. So we have smart charging, which means you'll see the charge rate on this Jeep go up and down as the TIPM requires it. It works exactly the same way, but we're using discrete integration, which means we're pulling signals out of the Chrysler side using hard wires and then running it through our analog and digital converter and then putting out whatever signals we need to the GM side so that it can react to it. With CAN bus, we're pulling CAN messages in and we're putting them out. We also can pull in discrete messages and put them out on the CAN. We can also pull in CAN messages and put them out discreetly. TIPM stands for Totally Integrated Power Module, but it's a lot more than just power. It's also called the Gateway Module, and the reason they call it the Gateway Module is because essentially all the networks in the vehicle meet at the TIPM. So it's a great place to get information, and it's very tempting to modify the TIPM to get the information we need or to achieve the functionality that we want. What I mean by that is we have things that we have to consider, like neutral safety. And neutral safety, while it can be done over a CAN bus, when you have a critical circuit, like a park neutral circuit, you really want to keep that hardwired. And manufacturers are required to do that by the DOT because it's very unlikely a hardwire is going to fail where a CAN message can. That's why if you look at like a tow missile, 
they run a small strand of wire for communication to it that way it can't be jammed so there are critical circuits that you need to keep discreet and we do that we do that with the park neutral some brake signals and some other signals that we'll talk about later you have to understand how Chrysler operates these vehicles when Chrysler builds a JK or pretty much any other vehicle they have what are called engineering files that are related to that vehicle what engineering files are is they are basically the build sheet for your vehicle it, it specifies what seats you have what cooling system you have what engine what transmission if you ever have to go into a dealership for service or a module replacement what they're going to do is they're going to tap into the dealer connect network and they're going to download the files the engineering files from your vehicle if your tip them goes bad you were to buy a new tip them and then have a program by a dealer they're going to put the same calibration in it that it was delivered with from the factory that way if you have a hard top it is going to be programmed for a rear wiper defroster etc and we've done that we've actually changed hard tops and added power seats or heated seats and you have to go in and reflash these modules so when you do that let's say your tip -in goes bad and you're driving through New Mexico and you go to a dealership they put a new tip -in, in if that dealer that added the hard top has uploaded your files to Chrysler when the new tip -in is installed and they refresh it they reload the tune in your tip -in, everything is going to work as normal if you've modified that tip -in, or the engineering files have not been updated by Chrysler then you flash that you may not have the functionality you want you may lose that rear wiper or whatever other option you have changed remote starts a big one a lot of dealers install remote start if you were to have remote start installed the dealer remote start and not reflash the network to reflect that you have a remote start then remote starts not going to work properly it's really important that you keep these modules stocked because if you ever go back to Chrysler and there is a module problem they're going to want to reinstall the module and the original software or at least the software that the engineering files that they have applied to here we are in a current build this is a 14 I believe maybe 15 JKU Rubicon unlike the Jeep that we were driving yesterday this Jeep has all of our newest technology this Jeep is fully can interfaced it has a LS3 with a 6L80 it's using our easy engine mount easy plug-and-play harness this has our full billet accessory drive for the LS3 we now do have the full accessory drive available for the LS3 to run the JK accessories and not like does it work great but it looks awesome when you get the polished aluminum billet accessories on an LS3 it really makes the engine look a lot better so pretty much everything on this is run through the key and interface the wire count on the interior in this Jeep is far less than the one we drove yesterday however if you look at the main harness it's the same wire count we have not reduced the power or ground distribution circuits we have not removed any of the diagnostics or trouble code and driving this Jeep is very similar to driving the early Jeep of course this is an LS3 so it has a little bit more power but you would be hard-pressed to tell the difference between this install with a CAN interface and the early MoTeC module if I come back into the tap shift gate you will notice some difference now I'm in sixth gear right now so if I were to pull it back we've changed our programming so that instead of saying six it says D and that way you know you're in top second overdrive gear but if I were to bump shift it you can see we are showing the current gear now I'm in tap shift and if I want to know that I'm back into six I bump it up and I'm back in drive so that is one little difference between the new setup and the old setup to be honest I don't really care about the current gear display because I don't drive off of a number I drive off of feel yesterday we drove a 5.3 in a relatively heavy JK with 37s this is an LS3 in a basically stock Rubicon with 32s so you can imagine it's pretty zippy this is one of my favorite combinations and I know I keep saying I have favorite combinations but that's based on need and application it really does feel like the JK should have felt from the factory and it doesn't feel like it has just enough power like if you had put a 5.3 in it feels like you went out you got the Camaro with a 6.2 
instead of the Camaro with a 3.6. And the 3.6 Camaro is over 300 horsepower, so it's pretty zippy. But a 6.2 and a JK, no matter when you get on it, even if you're on the highway, it pulls hard. And you gotta love the 6L80 transmission. I drove Pentstars with the five speeds, and I've even driven V8s with the WA580, and it's a huge leap above the 42 RLE or the old four-speed transmissions, but it's still not a 6L80. It can't match the, the lightning shift of the dual clutch, the RPM match shifting that the 6L80 has, so that when you upshift or downshift, especially off-road, it predicts the next gear and it revs the engine to match that gear so when the gear change is made it's virtually not noticeable. When you're in cruise control you're going up a hill. Gear spacing in the 6L80 is appropriate. There seems to be gaps WA580 to me. So when you're going up a hill and a downshift because of load it just increases your RPM a couple of hundred RPM. It's, it's very obscure. You can barely hear, hear or feel the shift. With the 6L80 you barely notice the shift at all. It's an excellent transmission. While the 8 speeds are out now I'm not sure I'd upgrade to an 8-speed if I had a 6-speed. I think I'm happy with a 6-speed. And I've said this before, if you've got a Corvette that goes 200 miles an hour, 8 speeds may not seem like a lot, but when you've got a Jeep that's maybe going 90 at the most, 8 gears are a lot. So you got to gear them up. you got to gear the 8-speeds up to take advantage of the tall tire size. There is a lot of confusion about the 8-speed, but currently we only support the 8-speeds in the Gen 5 motors. The Gen 5 L83 is going to become one of the engine swap engines of the future. It's going to be low cost, regular gas, and we're going to talk about the gas later because there's still a little bit of ambiguity about the gas. In fact, we can talk about it now. While some of these engines can run on regular gas, 5.3 LC9, the LMG, the 6.0 LY6, the 6.0 L96, they can easily run on regular gas. They have lower compression and their heads are designed for the lower octane fuel. If you do put medium in one of those engines, like a mid-grade fuel, you're probably going to see a little bit better performance. When would you want to do that? Well, if you load your family up, you're going into Utah and you're climbing some of the grades or you're cruising 80 miles an hour, the mid-grade can actually get you better mileage. So if you were to spend 5% more in mid-grade, you might get more than 5% better mileage because your octane scaler is going to go up the chart and you're going to be running higher, higher vac timing. If you're just cruising around town, low speed, under a light load, the regular is fine in those engines. Don't put regular in an LS3. The LS3, the L9H, the L92, the L94, those are essentially the 6.2 Gen 4 motors, have high compression heads and combustion chambers that really want premium gas. And that that's pretty much true whether you're under a light load or a heavy load. It is absolutely required if you're going over the Eisenhower Pass or high altitude pulling a heavy load, that you got to run premium in these 6.2s. If you don't, that scaler is going to come way back. The engine's not going to run good. You don't want to have a lot of engine knock, so don't mess around. Just run premium. And you're going to get better gas mileage with a premium than if you had tried to run a lower grade fuel. So I think it's really based on need what fuel you run. A lot of guys are just going to run premium anyway because they always have, and that's not a bad idea. With our full plug and play kit, which is going to include a power distribution center that just plugs in, the chassis connector and the interior connector, there's going to be no modifications to the harness at all. So you can get a GM harness right out of a box, plug it in, and you're on your way. This vehicle with the easy engine mounts in the LS3 is a piece of cake. There is no fabrication putting the engine in or in the entire swap. In fact, there's no drilling or cutting. There's no fabrication in this entire swap. The easy mounts make it easy to install an LS3. The LS3 having such a low intake, you can throw it in here with the easy mount, set it where you want it and tighten it down and you're done. You can actually move the engine forward and backward. You can move it left to right and you can move it up and down. If you have an axle clearance problem because you have a custom oil pan, you can move this engine up. If you had a truck intake and it was really close to the firewall, you could move the engine down. These easy mounts are extremely versatile and they are running a full size GM hydraulic V8 with AFM engines or four cylinder mode engine. You get the benefit of the dampening for the four cylinder mode. They run in fact, this Jeep I'm driving right now, I feel zero vibrations, nothing. Not in the wheel, not in the floorboard, it's, it's just dead smooth. So the easy engine mount system has really revolutionized installing the engine, as well as keeps you legal in some countries where you're not allowed to cut or modify the frame. Plus, it means now you're not going to have to worry about calling your friend or taking it to a shop if you have to have them weld the mounts in or cut the old mounts off. Transmission mounts are also bolt-in with a lot of adjustability so that if you run a 6L80, 8L90, our billet brackets are now in production for the LS3. They look awesome. They are 
machine from solid blocks of aluminum. They bolt on with no adjustment required. We're running a stretch belt on the air conditioning, which means there is no tensioner to fail. The early tensioners did have a tendency to bounce over time. The spring would get weak and they would stutter. GM ha actually had some software updates to try to correct that, but they were troublesome. So GM went to a stretch belt many years ago and so did we with a billet drive. So you put it on, it's pretty much good for the life of the engine or 75 to 100,000 miles you'll have to replace it. We ran the GM accessory drive for a while and we actually have run it from the beginning and we're still doing it today in certain builds, but you can't beat the JK drive. Let me tell you, when you put the JK drive on an LS3 or a truck motor and it puts everything back where it belongs, it just makes everything so much easier. You're not fighting the frame clearance on the air compressor. You're not fighting the power steering clearance to the power steering gear. You're not fighting the upper control arm brackets smacking the AC compressor. You're not building custom power steering and AC line. In fact, the AC line stay really short like stock you're not running them down on the bottom passenger side it really makes the swap feel right when you look at a JK with our billet accessory drive on it it just looks right if you're running PSC our billet accessory drive will accept the PSC pumps for the JK you can also run the stock pump with redneck ram we've had very good results with that setup through 37 inch tires if you are going to run a PSC with a ram I do suggest that you run the anti-splash valve as they call it and the LS or the V8 pulley. We spent a lot of time on the harness sourcing OE connectors so you can literally take an OE harness throw it into your Jake or a lift out motor. You can go to a wrecking yard buy a lift out engine with a harness and plug it in. Now there are a couple of different connectors based on four wheel drive, two wheel drive and engine year so make sure you talk to us before you get a lift out and you want to use the harness that it comes with. We do support most of them though. And our goal, and we are we have achieved it in several configurations and we're getting closer on all configurations, is that you throw this motor into your JK. You bolt it in. You don't cut, you don't weld. You plug in our integration harness into your factory harness. The engine mounts are bolted in. The billet drive is bolt on. There is no clearancing or fabrication work to make the accessory drive work. You plug in our CAN module on the interior, the data link connector, and the accelerator pedal. And that's it. That's the whole swap.